Church has always been a vital part of every believer's life. Hello, I'm Pastor Gray, pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Longview, Texas. Thank you for taking the time to tune in for this service. I'm standing in our auditorium, and here in just a moment, I'm going to take you into this auditorium as we are conducting the services here at 2200 West Loop 281. My heart's desire is that as the Word of God is preached, that God would do something during this service. Again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the services. I'll be back at the end. God bless you. Well, trick or treat, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And it's all treat here, isn't it? Praise the Lord. And I think that I have never been so unaware of what today is. Now, for us, it's a big day because, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I know you all have good secretaries here, but honestly, I do believe that I have the best, greatest secretary in the world, Victoria Lord. And today she's, is it 91 or 92? 91, 92? 91 or 92? 91, 92? She's 91, okay. Mrs. Lord, if you stream this, I, I always knew it was 91. But anyway, um, that's right. So over four decades, she's been uh, our, our, our secretary. And uh, she was my wife's fourth grade Sunday school teacher up in Indiana. Then uh, she moved down about a year before we did, and she was both of my daughter's Sunday school teacher. Then she became a granddaughter's Sunday school teacher and the world's greatest secretary. We humorously say, you gotta go through the Lord to get to the Pope at Christ Church. Amen. <laughs> and this is no joke. We were that close from hiring John Bishop's boy as our youth pastor, so we would have had the Pope and the Lord and the Bishop all in the same church. <laughs> Domini Patris, Spiritus Sanctum. And Mrs. Brown would have been really impressed with that, I'm sure. The Baptist Pope, I get kidded about that a lot. I've had people say, with a name like that, you should be a minister. Well, I am, you know, amen. But we're not Papists, no. But anyway, so this is her birthday, so October 31st is a big day for us. And it's also the day that uh, Martin Luther signed the, the, and, and, and nailed the 95 Theses to the war to the church door at the Wardenburg Castle, which was a great event. He was trying to catch up with the Baptists is what he was doing, but amen. So it's a great day other than the fact that it does scare a lot of people. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I thought I'd scare you a little bit since it's the 31st, amen. Did you bring your Bibles tonight? I, I feel like, um, I feel like, that last song and Brother uh, Gray's testimony there just really ruined what I was going to preach. But maybe it was, it was an alert. The, reason, the main reason I didn't want to preach this tonight because the last time you and I were together with your brother, I spoke along these lines. And, uh, and then I thought to myself, going back to a night uh, when we were remembering my father's life on this earth, and I want to just say there were wonderful services we attended. There were two funeral services for my father, but I think the greatest service that, uh, uh, that brought remembrances of my father more precious than ever was the service that we had right here uh, so many, many years ago. And it was along this theme that I preached, and I know that uh, Scott and, and I know that uh, Brother Bob Gray here, uh, it meant something to them. And I thought, you know, they've heard about everything I've to have to say on this matter. But I remember Daddy used to say this, son, when in doubt, just preach Jesus. <laughs> so that's the main reason I preach this message so much is because I've come to the pulpit in so much doubt, I've just run to Jesus as fast as I could. So tonight, there are different messages that I have on this, um, but tonight, the one that brings to my mind the thing that I want to thank the Lord most about is what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. And I will be honest with you, as a preacher's son, and Brother Gray knows what I'm talking about, you know, when people would talk about, um, well, I don't want to go to church because so many hypocrites there. Well, if you're a preacher's kid, you know who the hypocrites are. We can give you their email and their phone numbers. We know who they are. I remember one time I was just so frustrated with our youth pastor because I felt like he was being very pharisaical, and I made this stupid statement. I said, if he says one more word to me, I'm going to clean his plow. I think I weighed about 134 pounds. I wasn't going to clean anybody's plow, but, you know, I was full of uh, myself, and, and I was blaming others for me being where I was. 
And I remember my mother, we were on old Durant Road heading to our home in Valrico, Florida, when dad was pastoring in Brandon outside of Tampa. And uh, I remember at that time in my life, I was getting whipped every day of my life. Now, some kids got spanked. I never got spanked. I got whooped. Amen. <laughs> oh, I remember my father taking me to the bedroom and pulling out his 38, size 38 belt. <laughs> and as he would wrap it around his hand, he was explaining to me why he was going to, you know, give corporal punishment to his son. And he was a good aim. Boy, he knew right where to hit. Amen. Right where it hurt. And uh, now mother wasn't as very organized in her discipline. She just started swinging and hitting anything that was exposed. <laughs> Both of my parents should have been arrested. But anyway. <laughs> well, that was in the good old days when you didn't get away with wrong. Amen. I, I, and I thank the Lord for that. So when I mouthed off and said, I'm going to clean his pal, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to get whipped. This is going to be it. This is going to be, you know. So dad didn't say anything. Because usually when dad was going to minister corporal punishment, he would say very calmly. If you knew, those of you who knew my dad, you know, he could speak very calmly. But I'm telling you, that gentleman could beat the daylights out of you too. And, and he would say, Johnny, go to your room. Not mother. You know, you'd hear about some of these mothers saying, when your dad gets home, mother never waited for dad. Mom jumped. I mean, if dad wanted to join in the fun, he could. But, and I mean, she'd come at me and just cover quick. Mama's coming. Amen. I've been hit with spoons, switches. Oh, my favorite was go get me a switch. Do you ever have your mama say, go get you a switch? And don't, get a, don't, don't try to get a dry one. Because if you broke that, she'd make sure you come back with a green one. That hurts so bad. Belts, witches, hands, you know, <laughs> electric chairs. And so <laughs> I'm having a little fun here. If, if there's anybody from, you know, you, know, you know, welfare, don't worry. Everything's okay. I made it. <laughs> that didn't affect me. Affect me, affect me, affect me, affect me. <laughs> But I remember on that night, I was in the back seat, and I remember I could see the moon shining through the windows of the car, and mother was turning around, and I was bracing myself. And I remember the moonlight had captured her full face and her kind eyes, and she looked at me, and she said, Johnny, boy, if you keep looking at men, they're going to let you down you got to look at Jesus. He'll never let you down. And so mother got me on a quest that lasts, now now last for the better part of my life as I've read the red and studied the life and especially the passion of our Lord. It's been life-changing for me. Nothing and no one makes me want to do what I'm doing tonight more than when I consider what we're talking about tonight. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. I want you to go there with me. And uh, tonight, if those of you that are preacher boys here, I love to have these uh, young preachers out here on the front here. If you're looking for uh, three points in a poem, if you're looking for homiletical expertise, forget about it tonight. Uh, I don't think you're going to find uh, any homiletical perfection by any means right here tonight. But I want you to hear this, please, from the Word of God, Matthew 27. We're going to begin reading in verse number 27 of Matthew 27. I'm going to say thank you to those of you in the sound booth. So when I got away from this, you activated this. So that's nice. So when I pray, I usually kneel and pray. So, you know, somebody asked me as if it was a spooky thing. Why do you kneel and pray before you preach? Well, I'd say, first of all, I'm scared to death. I still am. After 53 years of preaching, I still get nervous as a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I'm nervous right now. That's why I'm rambling. Amen. I'm just nervous, you know. Um, but also, I would say, uh, two of my heroes, whenever they would preach, they would do this. My uncle, Red, C.F. Edwards, my mother's brother, always did that. And I remember as a young preacher, I thought, you know, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and not think so much of ourselves and realize that we need to beg God for help. Amen. So thank you for activating this, especially when I got down and prayed. 
Notice what it says in Matthew 27, verse number 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And when they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, and when they plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, <clears throat> and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Let's uh, pause for a moment and pray. When we're through praying, please take your seat. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful music we've heard. We can say like the old timers, we have walked about Zion in the music. As we've contemplated you and what you've done and who you are, thank you. As we've contemplated what we have in Jesus, thank you. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. What a wonderful name for a wonderful church. God with us. And we can truly say in these past couple of days that we've been here, and we know that was happening far before we got here, we could sense that you were indeed, Emmanuel, God with us. And I pray that the Holy Spirit might, might breathe upon us and give us that Holy Spirit unction to function so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be acceptable in my sight and be received by the people, and blessed of thee. Should I veer off onto the arm of the flesh, and say something that's not true, or say something that's not glorifying you, then correct me. Bring me back to the mind of Christ. O oh Lord, let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let that mind be in all of us. Should there be one in our midst that's a stranger to the saving grace of God, I pray, Father, that they'll repent and believe on the only begotten Son of God and not wait another day longer. May, if there are those that are trusting their church membership or a time in their life when they can look back and they don't really see that there was a true acceptance of Christ, I pray that tonight they'll get this thing settled once and for all. Then we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that need to just grow closer to Thee, to enjoy the infilling of the Holy Spirit. For Your precious Word tells us, You told us, Jesus, that He, the Spirit of the Lord, would testify of You. So we're counting on the Spirit of the Lord to testify of You tonight in this sermon. Bring glory and honor to Thy name. We love You, Lord Jesus. Thank You for all that You've done. Thank You for all that You're doing. Thank You for all that You're going to do. May everything now said and done for the rest of this service redound to thy honor. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to love thee more in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. Evening, I want to speak to you on this subject, watching Jesus die. Watching Jesus die. I want to talk, first of all, about the prayer before the cross. Then I'm going to talk about the pain endured just before and in the cross. And then I'm going to talk about the power beyond the cross. First of all, let's talk about the prayer before the cross. You know, I normally would use this kind of phraseology. For us to get a grasp of our subject tonight, but I want to change the wording and say, for the subject to get a grasp of us, for this thought to grab us, I really believe we need to go yonder to the Passover supper that became the last supper and the first Lord's Supper. There were approximately five million people in Jerusalem 
in the Passover in which our Lord died and became the literal Passover. When I was a youngster and mother would have a flannel graph lesson. Some of you remember the flannel graph lessons. And I remember when it was time for the triumphant entry that she would have a little donkey and a little felt back uh, image of our Lord on the donkey. And then there would be about 15 people. That's all you could get on the little flannel graph board. And so there would be about 15 people. And here came the Lord riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. So in my mind, when I think about the triumphant entry, I see that handful of people. Not so. There was a greater populace in Jerusalem, probably at this time, than there was even in Rome. And they were from all over the world. If you remember, Simon of Cyrene was there, whom it's mentioned. And he's from a place that's now mentioned as Tripoli from a very distant place. So people from all over the world that were of Jewish descent by DNA or Jewish uh, uh, belief because they were converts to Judaism were in Jerusalem on the Passover. So as our Lord rode in Jerusalem, they were lifting up palms saying, Hosanna. By the way, you know what those palms were, don't you? Now they had regular branches and clothes that they were using, but the Bible specifies also they were lifting palms. For you see, they used the green palm branches to build the Feast of the Tabernacles that had taken place uh, quite a few days earlier. And they looked like green, very stable, strong poles when they would make these thatched roofs, remembering when they were 40 years in the wilderness and God provided for them, and that's what they celebrated. So the little ladies would save at least a couple of those poles that by Passover dried out on the end and they made the perfect broom. And that's when they would sweep and clean their house, making it fit for Passover. So they were walking around some of the people with palms. So they utilized it with a second message. When Jesus came and they lifted up the palms and they were saying, Hosanna, which means save now. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They were saying, sweep us clean of the Pharisees in the temple. And basically that's what he did when he overturned the tables. He was sweeping them clean. But they wanted him to go further, many of them. He wanted, they wanted him to sit on David's throne and overthrow Rome. And they believed he would have no problem doing this. For many that were in that crowd had seen and, if not seen, heard that there were never any blinded eyes that he could not make see, deaf ears that he could not make hear, mute mouths that he could make not make talk, lame legs that he couldn't make walk, never any water that he couldn't walk over on top of. He was man enough to get thirsty and sit by a well, but God enough to turn water into unfermented wine. He was man enough that he's now riding the Jerusalem on the back of a little donkey, but they like to believe that he was God enough that he can come back on a white horse in glory, not later, but right now, and conquer Rome, Hosanna, sweep us clear and clean of these Gentile reprobates. Sweep us of the Pharisees and the hypocrites. Set up the kingdom, save now. And this is what really made the Pharisees nervous. And that's why they said at this time, at this juxtaposition with destiny, they said, the world is gone after him. We don't have a chance. Look how they worship him. Same week, same week, he partakes of the Passover with his disciples. You see, there's such a crowd now in Jerusalem that they have to divide up the Passover celebration. The northern tribes would celebrate the day of the Passover, the ten tribes, and Judah and Benjamin would celebrate on the day of the Passover. You say, well, why did the disciples of Jesus and Jesus celebrate the day before? Because every one of the disciples were from the northern district, except one, and that's Judas Iscariot. Only Judas was from Judea. The rest were from the northern district, from Nazareth and Galilee and these areas. So he celebrated with his disciples. It's an amazing thing. You know... When you consider what our Lord was doing, it was no coincidence that he celebrated on the Passover before, just before the Passover, because he became the Passover the next day. So they ate the Passover lamb. They ate from the bitter herbs. And what was left was the unleavened bread 
and the cup. No longer in this covenant meal, and that's what it was. It was the covenant meal of the New Testament or the New Covenant. No longer would they need the Passover lamb in the commemoration of the covenant meal, for Christ is the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, which taketh away the sin of the world. No need for us to take the bitter herbs because the Lord would take the bitter cup. He takes the remaining elements and he takes the bread that's unleavened and says, this is my body broken for you. And takes the cup and blesses it, my blood shed for you. And the Bible says, and afterwards they sang a hymn. You know, uh, I would have loved to have heard our Lord sing. But the great he, no doubt, did a little bit of what you did. He led his disciples in singing a hymn as they're heading toward Kidron and the 17th chapter of John and then Gethsemane. People sometimes have wondered, well, what was going on? What was he singing? Well, if you know anything about Hasidic or Orthodox Judaism, you don't have to guess what he was singing. It was the last psalm of the 13 psalms sung at the Passover that was sung. It was the ending of the Passover celebration. So our Lord now is heading toward Gethsemane and he sings. With, I would have loved to have heard that, wouldn't you? Did he have a baritone voice? Was it a tenor voice? Our people like to hear me sing tenor, 10 or 12 miles from here, amen? But I would have loved to hear Jesus sing. What did he sing? He sang 118 psalm. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In that same 118 psalm, they said, bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. If you draw a line to, to the horns of the altar, it's the perfect shape of a cross. He didn't say every day was a day. He said, this is the day. It was a day that was authorized by God himself. He anticipated man's need. He outlined every detail. Over 300 prophecies mostly having to do with his death upon the cross and his vicarious suffering for us. And now every one of these are about to be completely and totally fulfilled. This is the day which the Lord hath made. He is not dying martyr's death. He's dying like a king that marched the barrels of victory. He says, no man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. And somewhere between here and Kidron's Brook, he prays the true prayer of our Lord, Lord's Prayer. Oh, that we might be one, even as he and the Father are one. He crosses Kidron's Brook, going to Gethsemane, the place of tears, the place of the olive press. See our Lord as the tears begin to form in his eyes as he's crossing Kidron's Brook. How ironic. That's the same brook that David crossed. When uh, after the rebellion of Absalom, he was fleeing from Jerusalem to save his life, our Lord enters back into the perimeters of that holy city for man to take his life. Son of David, son of man, son of God with power. It's been said that Kidsman Brook probably by this time is now stained red with the blood of the lambs that have been slain. It's estimated that in the Passover, our Lord, that 275,000 lambs were slain in the Passover season of our Lord. And then he enters Gethsemane. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark, the 14th chapter. And I want you to meditate over a couple of verses here with me, if you don't mind. Mark, the 14th chapter. So our Lord comes into Gethsemane. Now we're going to enter into divine conundrum, seemingly contradictions. For you see, Jesus is the God-man, all God, all man, all God, all man. So everything God is, Jesus is. God is omniscient, meaning he is all-knowing. And yet, Luke chapter 2 says that Jesus in his youth grew in wisdom and stature. How does God who knows everything, I've often said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? How does he who knows all come to a point that he grows in wisdom? 
The answer is found in Philippians chapter 2. It's what the theologians call the kinesis. In other words, our Lord emptied himself into this earth. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was equal with God. Robbery is taking something that doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him, deity, and yet he emptied himself. Born of the virgin, having the flesh of David, the heart of God Almighty, all in one being. So in God's omnipotence, all power, he has chosen in the 33 and a half years, watch this, to learn the will of the Father like a man. He was tempted in all ways and manners like we are, yet without sin. He could be tempted because he was man. He could not give in to temptation and sin because he's God. So you see, he knew he was the die. All through the Gospels you will hear verbiage like going to Jerusalem, be killed, raised again, destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again. When he talked about following him, he used the language, take up your cross and follow me. Now this was not the dream world of James Avery jewelry. When we think of these beautiful crosses, it was in substance saying, if you want to follow me, lay on the table and get your lethal ejection. You want to follow me? Take a seat in the electric chair. You want to follow me? Step into the gas chamber with me. You want to follow me? Follow me to the execution. This is where he was headed. Oh, my friend, when we consider what our Lord was going through, it has to say, it has to make us say, what kind of mystery was involved there? For in Mark chapter 14, 32, it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and notice the wording, and began to be sore amazed. Now when we look at that sore amazed, it carries with it a heavy, heavy weight, sore amazed. There was one Greek scholar that I was gleaning after that said, that means in essence, shock and awe. When Desert Storm began, that's what they said that the enemy experienced, shock and awe. What was it that could have brought our Lord into shock and awe? It was so shocking that the Bible went on to say, and he saith unto them, by the way, it began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. How heavy? Watch this. And he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. All four places discuss the Garden of Gethsemane, some more in detail than others. Dr. Luke goes into a lot of detail. Here he says, and it said this in other places, he is sorrowful unto death. This is not hyperbole. This is not, this is not exaggeration. It is not metaphor, nor is it allegory. This is literal. He began to be sore amazed, and very heavy, he was literally dying right here, right now. Are you sure, Brother Pope? Not a doubt. Not a doubt, not a doubt. For, you see, Luke says it like this. Dr. Luke says that he sweat, as it were, great, great drops of blood. And he also said at this point of time, that an angel came and ministered to him. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to go ahead and turn to Hebrews 5, and I want you to see something with me, verse number 7. It says in Hebrews 5 and verse number 7, as you're looking there, keep in mind, he sweat as it were great drops of blood. 
your blood, or rather your sweat, comes from your bloodstream. And under great duress and stress, people have been known to have actually had blood come from the pores of their skin. I believe it was pouring nearly from Jesus. He was going through trauma like you can't imagine. He began to be sore amazed. He began to be in shock and awe because of the information that he's downloading at this time as he goes to the Father in prayer. His soul is exceeding sorrowful into the very throes of death as he's literally dying. Uh, let me just say this parenthetically. Well, what exactly was happening? The Bible tells us a thousand years before he died, the Psalm 22 begins, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, and so on. It says in the middle of that psalm, they pierced my hands and my feet. That never happened to David, that's Jesus. In that prophecy it says, my heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. For the heart is surrounded by a watery sack. When the muscle of the heart breaks, the water breaks, the muscle of the heart breaks, and flowing into your stomach and literally into your bowels is blood and water. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. And the reason we know that happened because when they put the spear in our Lord's side, out flowed blood and water. His heart had burst. Medical science says a man can live five days with a broken heart. Hebrews 5 and 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Our Lord's heart was breaking so seriously with the information he was downloading that he was about to die in the garden and the father had to send an angel to strengthen him so that he would live to die upon the cross. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And he prayed repeatedly. As Mark says, verse 36, and he said, Abba! Father, all things are possible to thee. thee. Take away this cup from me. There was a man who had studied that word Abba for many years. Like many of us as preachers, we'll look at that word and we say, you know, among the Hebrews, that means like dad or daddy. But it's a little bit more than that. It's amazing. You know, I remember when I went to Monterey, Mexico, when I was 18 years of age, within one week I was speaking a little Spanish. If you're around it, you can pick it up. So this man was in Israel, and he saw a father and his young son go together in the restroom, and the father commanded the boy to go over and wash his hands, and he said he heard the father say, when you call me Abba, I expect you to do exactly what I say. And the man said, I understood for the first time exactly what Abba meant. Yes, it is the term that a youngster uses for daddy, but it's a term that is used meaning, you are my father, I will obey exactly what you tell me to. Abba, I will obey exactly what you tell me. And as it's said in other places, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Abba, Abba. What brought him into shock and awe? What was this prayer talking about? Mr. O'Reilly had it wrong when he said in his book, Killing Jesus, that Jesus was scared. Jesus wasn't scared. He wasn't trying to get away from the cross. What was, he, what was it that was revealed to him that broke his heart and brought him into the very throes of death? Many have speculated. But it's an amazing thing how the Bible can really give us and understanding. For you see, Habakkuk says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. 
Oh, yes, God sees the wrong that is done, but he doesn't meditate over it. He doesn't ingest it. He's of purer eyes than to behold evil. Uh, you see the angels given at this number in heaven. You see when uh, Noah had become inebriated and Ham was defiling his father in some way and tried to talk, uh, Japheth and, and Shem, and the, they turned their back on it because thou art of pure eyes and then behold evil, none so holy as God, not even the angels, and not Shem and Japheth, none like Jesus, who's God. He knew the price of what was revealed to him and what was revealed to him. I feel like taking my shoes off to a degree when I do this because I'm speculating the dialogue. Because you can see from the request, if it be possible, and the repeated request that it appears to be dialogue between the Father and the Lord Jesus. My Father... The time is here. Yes, my son, I'm ready to die. You know you'll be going to the cross. I know that's where I'm going. It won't be stoning. I understand. They will pierce my hands and my feet. I understand that. My son, my father, you're ready to die. I'm ready to die. You have grown in wisdom and stature, but there is one portion of the price that you must pay that I have not yet revealed unto thee, but I must now. I am thy servant, O Lord. You must become sin. You must become Johnny Pope. You must become Bob Gray. You must become Barbara Pope. You must become... Oh, Father, I'm willing to die for them, but it will not, son, be efficacious. The atonement will not be made unless you're truly the substitute. You must become, you, well, you mean dying is in like in their place, in their place as them you become. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, and let that cup pass from me. You see, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, that's the Father, hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the only way we can be saved, and that is if he dies as the sinner I am, as you are. Penal substitution. A lot of even the evangelicals don't like those words, but it's the only way. The wrath of God is now upon him. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so he, if he becomes me, must take the wrath of God, the hell that I deserve. He became sin for us. My father's favorite verse, 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Isaiah 53 said, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it is all, isn't it? He is a propitiation for our sins, not for our sin only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Strange as it may seem, and he shall see, the Bible prophesied in Isaiah 53, the travail of his soul and be satisfied. The prayer before the cross. He finds the disciples sleeping now for the third time. Sleep on. 
Now they come with torches that take away the light of the world, shackles to band up the hands that made the bands of Orion. Simon Peter gets nervous. But I think he's braver than normal because he pulls out a sword. You say, why would he pull out the sword? Because remember, they said, when Jesus asked, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth, John 18. And Jesus said, I am he. I love the integrity of the King James translators because if you look at that in John 18 when it says, I am he, the words H-E are in italics, meaning because they're not seeing a word-for-word -word translation, so they put the word H-E there. So when they said, we're looking for Jesus, he did a station identification. He said, you're looking for the shepherd. You're looking for the carpenter. Uh, let me tell you who you found was I am. You say, are you sure that's what he was saying? Uh-huh. Why do you think 600 of the 1,200 men fell down right there? Boom! Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am that I am! I think Peter's observing that thing. Oh, man. So he pulls out the sword. Yeah, we get into trouble here. He'll just do another I am, and we're good. Huh? So Peter pulls out a sword, and he's about as good as swordsman. He's a fisherman at times. He's not, he didn't say, I'm going to cut your ear off if you don't quit this. No. He was aiming dead center head. He just missed and got the ear. I can see the guy squalling like a dying calf in a hailstorm. Ah, ah. Jesus picks up the ear. Hush. Thank you. <laughs> Even at this very moment when they're taking him away, he's showing forth his omnipotence. No man takes it from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. And he says to Simon Peter, Peter, put up your sword. If I wanted to, I could call 12 legion of angels. I think when we think about that, we're not thinking about it correctly. I remember when there was a songwriter that sang a song or wrote a song, he could have called 10,000 angels. Quit cutting it short, man. 12 legion would be the number beginning at 72,000 and topping off at 144,000. Fine, let's go for the lower number. 12 legion, 72,000 angels. That's an interesting number, isn't it? If I wanted to, I could call 72,000 angels, Peter. I don't need your little pen knife. Put it up. Because he has 72,000 angels with flaming swords ready to deliver him. Oh, and he would have been delivered. One angel in the Old Testament, oh no, Senor, one took out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Can you imagine what 72,000 really bent out of shape angels could do? Wow. The prayer before the cross, now the pain endured approaching and in the cross. They take him to Annas, from Annas to Caiaphas. He's before 72 men in the Sanhedrin. It's estimated that 39 or 40 decided to administer mockery and a beating. The Bible said, now at two different places, he's buffeted. This is the first place he's buffeted by the religious guys. Let me show you what buffet means if you would look at it in the Greek language. Here's the word buffet. I'm going to illustrate it to you. Buffet means to curl your fist and throw all your weight behind it. That's what they did to Jesus. The plays and the movies depicting the passion of Christ are more polite than they really need to be. Isaiah said it like this in Isaiah 52, 14. His visage is so marred more than any man. His visage is so marred more than any man. C.I. Schofield had it correct on his comment, meaning that Jesus was so brutally beaten that his features of his face were virtually nondescript. And yet the miracle, not one bone was broken. About 40 men slugged him in the face. They take him to Pontius Pilate. Pilate's wife says, have thou nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered many things today in the dream because of him. Pilate finds out that Herod's in town because of the Passover, sends him to Herod. Herod wants to see 
him do a miracle and Jesus didn't say a word to that old fox. As the old spiritual said, he didn't speak a word, not a mumbling word. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shear is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. They take him back to Pilate. There seems to be two presentations as you study the passion. There seems to be two presentations of, of Pilate presenting Jesus. They're crying out, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Many scholars believe that the design of Pilate was to get Jesus tortured to the point that everyone will have mercy and say, release Jesus and give us or rather, re release Jesus and crucify Barabbas. But that's not what happened. Whom we you that I release unto you? Crucify him! Crucify him! Give us Barabbas! Pilate said, why, what evil hath he done? Three times he said, I find no fault in him. At one time he even says it like this, I find no fault in him at all. There are at least 14 illegalities in both the civil and ecclesiastical trials of Jesus. 14 laws were broken to get the innocent one to the cross. Finally, in exasperation, Pilate's about to wash his hands, but he says this statement, and I believe he was so frustrated that he spoke it out in his own native tongue. Isi homo, isi homo. Behold the man. Uh, we use that term loosely, don't we? When we admire something someone's done, we'd say, you're the man. And this is basically what Pilate was saying. I've never seen anything like him. I asked him if he had a kingdom. I'm using my own imagination here. I asked him if he has a kingdom. He says his kingdom's not of this world. And he's so cool and calm and collected with his wrath. My servants wanted to, they would release me. Isiomo! Who is this man? No wonder he put, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The Jews were saying, don't put that. He said, no, what I've written, I've written. He is more than any of you. I've never seen anything like him. I'm just doing this because I'm a politician, but I'm telling you, I've seen something here that's out of my purview of explanation. I don't understand what is happening. I don't understand why you want him dead. He speaks like a king. He walks like a king. He is a king. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. We know him as king of kings and lord of lords. You want to have mercy on him? Come on. He turns him over to a group of men that torture him. They're not regular Romans in the army. These are the mercenaries. And according to the history of Rome, these are the guys that when they're given a victim, they torture and mock them playing virtually top that. Let's see who can hurt him worse. Let's see who can insult him worse. So they tie his wrists together. They stretch his body until the body, until the toes just barely touch the ground or they dangle a little bit off of the pavement. The body's fully stretched. They take a cat o nine tails. Some say there could be much more than nine tails, but here's what we're sure of. On the end of each leather thong would be a piece of sharp bone, metal, and or glass. I believe it was sharp bone. That would be the most common thing used. And each leather thong had this sharp bone secure on the end of it. When the, when the whip was thrown into the body, it was thrown with great speed. And the centrifugal force wrapped the body with ease. And with this force of centrifugal workings, the bone would fall into the flesh as easily as a pebble would fall into the pond. So now with all of these pieces of bone burying the flesh, when they pulled it back, 
not only would it cause a cutting sensation, but because of the stretched position, it would cause a ripping sensation so that according to Roman history, it was not unusual at all for a man to be ripped right in half at the whipping post. Remember the prophecy of Psalm 22? I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. When you could see Jesus hanging upon the cross, you would see his rib cage like ivory fingers coming up out of the bowls of blood. Pieces of his flesh are now hanging to his knees and ankles as the blood is pouring down his exposed bone of his back and bone of his ribs and even some of the scab regions of the face. Scabbed regions of yes. See Isaiah 56. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. The Sanhedrin spit upon him, the mercenaries spit upon him. And I can see the piece of bone, some flying into his jaw and pulling the flesh off of his jawbone, off of his face that now is nondescript. And then they threw him down and put a purple skull robe about him and they take a crown of thorns, not thorns like we're used to here in East Texas, but more like West Texas or Arizona thorns, six to nine inches in length, as sharp as a needle on the end, as strong nearly as a ten penny nail. And they entwined it so that from a distance it looked like a crown. And so they crowned him with thorns and mockery and they put a reed into his hand and they bowed the knee, hell king of the Jews! <laughs> And then somebody takes the reed, not like a bamboo piece of your fishing pole. This is more like a small baseball bat. And somebody takes that little bat, and when they smite Jesus upon the head, they're driving the crown of thorns into the scalp so deep it scrapes the skull until great bubbles of blood fall down over the scab regions of our Lord's face and the front and the back that looks like raw hamburger. Isiomo, behold the man. And he says nothing in his defense. But God, who is rich in his mercy, mercy there was great and grace was free. He's doing all of this for you and for me so that we would not have to go to hell. This mocking, this spitting, this beating, this incredible episode of evil at its worst. They led him up the Via Della Rosa, the way of the pain. The cross is laid down. I can see them preparing the hammer and the nails and they turn back around and Jesus is stretched out upon it. I can overhear one say to the other, well, he's different. All the others are wrestling with us right now, but he's just laying his life down. Jesus said, greater love and no man than this, than that a man laid down his life for his friends. And I can see them as they stretch the nail. And there's some speculation, was it through the center of the palm? If it was, it would have to be secured by ropes so it wouldn't rip through. But I lean toward, because forearm is still considered part of the hand, but it was in this area of the wrist. It went between the bones, not breaking the bone, so that when his body fell, it fell on the nails as the nails suspended him between heaven and earth. Can you see that mighty hammer going up over his head? Can you imagine it as it's coming down and it hits that more like the size of a railroad spike but thinner? And see the capillaries and the veins begin to break and spray. And they keep nailing till it's secure. Then his other hand is nailed. Then one foot is stretched out upon the other. And the top foot is nailed. And the bottom foot is nailed. And with a sickening thug, you hear that final blow bruising his head feet. Six men lift up that cross into the air. One of them cries out, let it drop. And you can hear another sickening thud as you hear it fall. And then the bones are popping out of joint. And there he hangs between heaven and earth. And what does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Before you would bring judgment upon them, Father, give them an opportunity to know what they've done today. They've nailed their salvation to the cross. Father, forgive them. And now for 2,000 years, every time whosoever will calls upon the name of the Lord, that prayer is answered, isn't it? Two thieves are railing against them. <clears throat> One of them wises up and says, Lord, 
remember me when thou enterest to thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. You don't go into a soul sleep. The moment you pass from this life, you enter the presence of our Lord. He sees Mary, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Don't look at me as your son now, but as your savior, woman, behold thy son. Right? On that cross. I'm rearranging some of the statements here for purpose. I want you to see something. He was on the cross for six hours. The three hours he was there, the last three were darkness. Darkness. Egyptian hieroglyphics had nailed this day down. And Egyptian hieroglyphics say, surely God must be dying today because of the darkness. It wasn't a normal eclipse. Darkness covered the earth. The High King of Ireland, in the annals of Irish history on this very day, panicked when it went dark, and he ran into the middle of the court. He had a piece of battle axe in his head from a previous battle, and as he ran, the battle axe piece went deeper into his brain, and the High King of Ireland died at that moment when darkness covered. It's in the Egyptian, it's in the Egyptian history, it's in Irish history. It wasn't a partial darkness. It wasn't a special eclipse. It was the entire world got put in the darkness. And he said, I thirst. The Bible says to fulfill all prophecies, it was more than just a thirst. The last time he said anything about drinking was back in the garden when he said, let this cup pass from me. But do you remember what he said to Simon Peter in John 18? He says, the cup that my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now he says, I thirst. And I think our father says, angels, take it. The entire cup of all man's sin Give it to him, and as it's poured upon him, he's becoming me. He's becoming you. I thirst. Take the cup. In that cross, in that darkness, he cries, Eli, Eli, Abbasabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Do you remember when he was baptized by John? The Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a heavenly dove. And the Father spoke saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I well please. The Holy Spirit, like a dove, is so sensitive that if we grieve the Holy Spirit or we quench the Holy Spirit, he takes his flight in power. At this time, and by the way, let me just say something parenthetical, okay? Because people wonder about this. What is blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? Are you ready? Basically, it's rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. Because see, Jesus did all of his miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. So to say that Jesus who is not who, who is not who he said he was is to blaspheme against God the Holy Spirit and Jesus said, you see the divine trinity is very humble. So you have spoken against the Holy Spirit. You've rejected me. You've rejected the Holy Spirit. You direct the Holy Spirit. You direct the Father. You direct the, you, 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 you rejected the Father. Just a little something to think about. But when Jesus was receiving all of my sin and your sin, I think the Holy Spirit might have said, you know, I have to leave now. And suddenly as the Holy Spirit takes his flight, Jesus is overwhelmed and says, my God! And then I can see 72,000 angels pulling out flaming swords and the father says angels turn your backs but father turn around fold thy wings they resheath their flaming swords and they fold their wings and they turn about and if ever angels had tears I believe at this time there's some tears in heaven not by man but by angels who had been waiting on Jesus for millenniums, and now at his greatest hour of need, they must turn around. Then the Father himself does an about face. I know we're using anthropomorphic terms, but that's what's necessary for us to understand the concept of what is happening. As the Father now turns his back, then Jesus says the second time, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a conundrum. What a seeming contradiction. No. God 
is dying. But God can never die. So the Holy Trinity arranges it. God is forsaken of God. I don't understand that. I don't get that. But I accept it. What a Savior. What a Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Forsaken of God so that we might have the privilege of him never leaving us and never forsaking us. If I were to ask you to raise your hand, if you were to ask, be asked by me, how many of you feel worthy of that? I could not lift my hand. I am not worthy of that kind of agape love. I'm not worthy of him taking my hell. And I don't know how it happened, but I believe, Brother Gray, that the eternity of my hell, past and future, was condensed on Jesus. I don't know how, but I know that he became sin for me and took the full penalty paid in full paid in full oh yeah oh yeah because soon after this he says it is finished I've been to Gordon's Calvary and I've seen Gore from Gordon's Calvary the Temple Mount there's no doubt in my mind in the day and age in which they were living when they were administering some of the very final Passover lambs, they heard Jesus' voice echoing through the temple when he said it is finished. Now what they heard would be the Koine Greek, one word and one word only. G-tele-stoy! One word. It was the same word used whenever the priest would look at a lamb. If it had no flaw, no blemish, and it was meat for sacrifice, he'd say, Tetelestai, meat for sacrifice. It's a pure lamb. It was the same word used whenever a man was in debtor's prison. The ordinances that he had broken were nailed to his prison door and a benefactor usually a loved one would pay for his crimes when it was paid for the document the parchment was stamped to tell his die meaning paid in full and the door of his prison was open because the debt had been paid to tell his die it was the same word used by a sculptor or an artist when he did something that was worthy of being a masterpiece, he would say, as a few times did, to tell a sty. Can you imagine me going over to Italy and I'm crossing a velvet rope with a hammer in one hand and a chisel in the other hand and somebody says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to finish uh, Michelangelo's David here. I'll be under arrest. They might say to me on the way to the jail, you're crazy. It's a masterpiece. It's done. You can't do anything. When Jesus said to tell us, I, that's what he's saying. Nothing can be added to this. It is a masterpiece. This is done. It's completely finished. It, glory to God. It was the same word used when the Cyclops, the Cyclops, they were like our Marine Recon. They were our Green Beret. They were our Delta Force. They were our Navy SEALs. Are you all with me for a moment? Their job was so dangerous. When they were in battle, their families would wait on the outside of Athens to hear the outcome. Their sweethearts, their wives, moms, dads, grandparents, uncles, aunts, kids, nephews and nieces. If it was an overwhelming victory and the Cyclops had defeated the enemy so soundly that there would not be an arising up again, if it was a thorough defeat, the runner would run back to the edge of Athens. He would throw his hands in the air and say but one word. Titanistai! And when he said that, they would jump for joy because it means the victory Three is one. When Jesus cried it is finished on the cross, he wasn't saying it's finished to his life. He's saying, I am the Passover lamb. It is acceptable. I'm paying man's debt 
right here, right now. Nothing will be put to it, nor anything added to it, for God doeth it. Re 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 Ecclesiastes 3.14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing shall be put to it, nor anything taken from it. God doeth it. The men shall bear it before him. You can't add to it. You can't take from it. And, and, I see the devils getting whipped, and everybody that gets saved are going to be saved forever. Victory! Victory! That's what it is finished means. And then finally he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Herein is such wonder and awe I can hardly stand it. If you, look at, if you look at Hebrews 9, 14, you can see why I'm so much in awe. Do you believe the Bible literally? Oh, I believe the Bible literally. Yes, indeed. I'm going to show you something. Hebrews 9, 14. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. In the Messianic Psalms and the chronological, chronological sequence, you have Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now there's the darkness on the cross. But then Psalm 24, by the way, before we get to Psalm 24, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of our great king? Those who have studied the stars, the astronomers have said there's a hole in the northern sky where there are no constellations. And no, it's like a hallway that goes up, 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 up. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of our great king, right? Psalm 24, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And then you get to the bottom part of that psalm, and here's what I believe happened. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Up, up, up in split second timing, he goes to the outside of the gates of glory and says, as you read there in this 24th Psalm, open up your gates and be you lifted up and the king of glory shall come through. Who is the king of glory? He says, the Lord strong and mighty and battle is he. Open up your gates and be you lifted up your everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Gabriel, yeah, Mike, that's him. Open up and the doors open up. And those same angels that had folded wings, those same cherubims that folded their wings, lift them up now. And even as the tabernacle and the temple had the picture of those two cherubims, as they put their wings over the mercy seat, that's where the blood was. They lift up their wings, and Jesus, as victor through the eternal spirit, walks in up through the glory place, coming toward the throne of God, where God the Father turns back around and the Holy Spirit begins to hover as Jesus takes his own blood, literally in places on the mercy seat, and says, Father, this is my blood for their sins. You say, are you sure about that? Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Tis done! Tis done! The great transaction's done. And in split second timing, he goes down into paradise. Abra, how are you? David, doing all right? And... We're going to leave in just a little bit, but I need to say something to the people in Gehenna. You should have believed. Every one of the sacrifices were pointing toward me. Every one of the pieces of furniture were pointing toward me. You should have believed. And then the devil, meantime, on the beginning of that Sabbath, he comes up to the tomb of Jesus. I'm using some imagination. Death is guarding the grave of Jesus. Death! Yes, your satanic majesty. Have you got him? Oh, I've got him just like I got that crazy Baptist preacher. Oh, I've got him. I've got him. Just like I got David. And the devil says, but he saw corruption. Where's your friend? You, 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 you mean corruption? I mean corruption. Where is he? You know we work together. I know you do. Where is he? He's not here yet. He better get here. Yes, sir. The devil walks away. Corruption. Corruption. Where are you? 
Hurry up and show up. You know he's dead. Get over here. Do the rotting thing. Come on, come on, come on. The second day, the devil starts coming by the tomb. Death! <laughs> yes, your satanic majesty. Have you got him? I'm not letting him go. And where's your friend? Corruption? Uh, yeah, he'll be here. Just, just you wait. Keep him! devil walks away. Corruption! Where are you? Hurry up and get here. Morning of the third day, before devil can make his rounds, death throws his hands up to his face and says, Look out! Look out! I can't hold him! I can't hold him any longer! Corruption never showed up, and up from the grave he arose. A mighty triumph for his foe. Hallelujah! Christ arose! And he calmly comes up out of the grave clothes, takes that napkin that was on his face. And by the way, in the Greek, it's a dinner napkin, very symbolical. You see, when you were going to leave and not come back to the table, you crumple the napkin and leave it there. If you were coming back to the table, had to go away for a moment, you would fold it. It means you're coming back. And so I can see our Lord as he's folding the napkin. As he's, oh, glory to God. I, I know what's happening next. But anyway, uh, as he puts it down, the devil says, I'm going to do this myself. And he comes to the tomb of Jesus and throws one towel onto one side of the tomb, another towel on the other side of the tomb and said, where are you going? And Jesus says, out of here. I didn't give you permission. Jesus said, I didn't ask. And the devil says, no. In him are all the promises, yea, and amen to the glory of God. And Jesus lifts up his nail-pierced foot, and the devil's looking through that hole, and he remembers Genesis 3.15, although he's bruising his heel, he shall bruise thy... And the devil head, and the devil says, get your foot off my face. <laughs> Jesus says, I will, but you've got something that belongs to me. And Jesus takes the keys of death, hell, and the grave rattles him a little bit in his face and he rises up out of that grave and Mary supposing him to be the gardener found out that he was the one that grew the flower he is the master the great Rabboni who has risen from the grave and Jesus said he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die so Yesterday, Mrs. Brown did not die. You see. You see. Today, my wife and I went to a place in Hawkins, Texas, where the body of my sweet mother and my father lay. But they're not there. But I thought, now's a good time for Jesus to come. I, just, I thought to myself, I need to step back because they're coming up. Amen. And it's all because of the cross. We were picking out some, you know, silk flowers, and I said, let's find some for Grandma and Grandpa Wright, and we're going to go back to veterans and put some flowers there and remember these great people, but we're just going to say hot goodbye, but au revoir. We'll see you again. And it's all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. And best of all, as we heard the quartet singing, the trio singing a while ago, and best of all, we will see him. Yeah. That's what excites me the most. And we were in Scotland a few days ago and we talked to a 101-year-old lady and the best thing she said about heaven, she said, is going to be that you're going to see Jesus? And she had that twinkle in her little blue eyes like she couldn't wait. She had been waiting for a long time, but soon and very soon she will see him face to face and we will too. And if we had a thousand years and a thousand ways to say thank you, it wouldn't be enough. That's why we're going to just praise him forever. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to view our services. I trust that the sermon, the message, the truth was a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. If I can do anything for you or Emmanuel Baptist could be a blessing to you or yours, please reach out to me. Let me know. I also would like to know what God has done in your heart. I would love to rejoice with you. I would love to pray with you. I would love to add your prayer requests to our Wednesday night prayer bulletin. So if you want to, number's at the bottom of the screen. Text me, let me know. God bless you, and I trust that the Lord will bless your day. Join us again for another broadcast here at Emmanuel Baptist Church.